Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Nabil Sultan. I'm a nephrologist in uh, London, Ontario, and it's uh, my pleasure to be with you today in this first annual CPPF conference. Uh, today I've been asked to speak about approach to hypertension for the general practitioner. So we'll uh, try to take you through a high level uh, summary review of, uh, of these objectives, the general approach to hypertension approach to resistant hypertension, and an approach to secondary hypertension. So first of all, this is a slide uh, to remind us how important this topic is. In this study, they showed that in a population-based study that every uh, 20 millimeters of mercury rise in your blood pressure, in your systolic uh, blood pressure from the usual blood pressure that a patient has is associated with a two-fold difference in ischemic heart disease and vascular deaths. And every 10 millimeter drop in your usual systolic blood pressure or five in your usual diastolic blood pressure lowers your risk of stroke death, ischemic heart disease or vascular death by 30 to 40%. So what this slide is really saying is that blood pressure is a relevant, uh, is a relative um, uh, marker. And it would, regardless of the blood pressure of a patient, if we can bring down their blood pressure or if we can avoid it from rising, we will definitely have a big impact on their future health, their future vascular health. And, and this is why this is such an important topic. It is one of the most, it continues to be one of the most profound um, uh, interventions we can do in medicine at a, at a population level. I'm going to be using for the first part of the talk, uh, the Hypertension Canada guidelines. Um, uh, there's many guidelines for hypertension out there in the world. Um, and every guideline tries to do their best to bring together the evidence in a way that can be easily understood and implemented. And Canada has done that and will follow uh, the Canadian uh, guidelines here. Uh, it's important to remember that when we're talking about hypertension, it all depends on how you're measuring the blood pressure and in what context. And so if you're talking about automated office blood pressures, you're talking about blood, uh, blood pressure target or diagnosis of hypertension by definition is more than 135 over 85. But if you're talking about manual office blood pressure, the Canada guidelines would say it's more than 140 over 90 that you would target. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring uh, that patients would do at home with an ambulatory blood pressure machine. Uh, it depends uh, if you're talking, talking about the mean uh, 24 hour, which includes overnight and while they're asleep, or if you're just talking about awake, if they're, if you're doing the mean while they're awake, it's 135 over 85. And if it's the mean 24 hour, it's 130 over 80. And if it's home blood pressure monitoring, just using an automated blood pressure monitor at home, it's 135 over 85. I will make these uh, slides available, hopefully to everyone here. So you can use these uh, slides to go back to them and to get the exact uh, numbers. So it, it, it depends uh, how you're checking the blood pressure and in what setting when you want to diagnose hypertension. And definitely home blood pressure readings are ideal to rule out white coat hypertension, which is very common. This is a bit busy slide that I'm basically leaving in the slides for you guys to look at afterwards. But basically, it's the same idea. It depends. It takes you through this algorithm based on how you're measuring blood pressure and in what setting and if whether or not you have diabetes, there's different settings for the, the, uh, the specific um, diagnosis of hypertension. Now, once you um, have identified a patient with hypertension, what should you be ordering uh, in your office? You should be ordering a number of blood tests. Electrolytes and creatinine are very important given, given that many hypertensive patients um, uh, do have uh, renal impairment. A fasting blood glucose and an A1C are very important because hypertension diabetes are very common. And, uh, and lipids, uh, fasting lipids is also important. You should also be ordering a urinalysis, including and, and include a urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Many people will order urinalysis, but will not order an albumin to creatinine ratio or a protein to creatinine ratio, but that is very important uh, to actually quantify accurately protein excretion from the kidneys. And patients who do have elevated protein excretion are at much higher risk of both renal outcomes, but also cardiac outcomes. So you do need to measure that. And the urinalysis is simply not an accurate measure of protein excretion. So please do not rely on urinalyses and try to order urine albumin to creatinine ratio or protein to, uh, to creatinine ratio, which are spot urine tests and they're not 
you don't need to do the full 24 hour urine, but try to do the, uh, the spot album to creatinine. Uh, ECG is also very helpful to know if the patient is exhibiting any, any, um, uh, any signs of heart disease and ruling out pregnancy in women, of course, is very important. Uh, for a patient with hypertension, you want to pursue lifestyle measures for sure. This should be the first thing that you go to in general practice. Uh, as, as you know, low salt diet is really at the heart of, uh, of, of our dietary management. Um, and, um, and, and here in North America, we spend a lot of time reminding patients that it's not just adding salt to your food, but it's all of the processed, packaged, frozen food, canned food that has so much salt in it. Even bread, for example, can have a lot of salt. So sometimes patients need to be educated on where the salt is coming from. There is a common diet called DASH diet, which is a general healthy diet um, that, uh, that, that we could also recommend to patients. Obviously, smoking cessation is very critical, especially in our in 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 in, in our uh, in our context in, in in the Middle East and in Palestine, where smoking rates unfortunately are very high and are contributing to hypertension and vascular disease all the time. Exercise is really critical. It's a very it's a profound um, intervention for lowering blood pressure. And we're not talking about um, uh, unbelievable amounts of exercise. We're talking about moderate intensity, 30 to 60 minutes, a brisk walk um, a few times a week really has a big impact on blood pressure. So reminding patients about that and talking about it by the physician actually has been shown to make a big difference in compliance, patient compliance. Weight loss is very important and, and, and weight loss does lower blood pressure. Alcohol and NSAID avoidance and stress management are all important lifestyle measures. In terms of just general rules of thumb for goals of therapy, I generally go by this, less than 140 over 90 in everybody is a good general rule of thumb. Less than 130 over 80 in diabetic patients and patients with CKD is also another good rule of thumb. Now the SPRINT trial was a big trial that came out a few years ago that kind of contradicted a lot of increasing evidence which was pointing at we, that, that you don't really need to be aggressive in blood pressure lowering, that you get most of your benefit going less than 140 and maybe less than 130, but not more aggressive than that. The SPRINT trial contradicted the, the multiple trials that showed that it was a well done trial. It was a large trial, but it was a trial in a specific patient population. There were patients that were over 50 years old and were at significant cardiovascular risk and a third of them ended up having chronic kidney disease. And in that patient population, they showed a reduction, a significant reduction in the primary outcome when you aimed for less than 120 systolic. They did not uh, have a diastolic target. They just had a systolic target of less than 120. And those patients that were in that group did the best. So in that specific patient population, you can consider less than 120, but otherwise less than 130 over 80 in diabetics and chronic kidney disease and less than 140 over 90 in everybody else. Now, what are you gonna go to in your office when you diagnose someone with hypertension? What's your go-to medications? I would put forward that these are generally the recommended go-to medications. First, an ACE or an ARP, not both, but an ACE or an ARP um, uh, are, are excellent medications, particularly if you have someone with CKD or any uh, protein in the urine, any microalbuminuria, you should go to an ACE and ARP first. Heart disease patients and low EF patients also go to an ACE or an ARB first is it's generally recommended. And again, do not combine ACE and ARBs. There's been now um, uh, multiple studies that have shown that to be a negative, uh, uh, be associated with negative uh, outcomes. Uh, a calcium channel blocker uh, like amlodipine or Norvasc is very common and is very effective. So that's another go-to medication. Uh, thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics are also recommended first line in these, in, in general hypertension um, and beta blockers are also um, uh, useful, particularly in patients with coronary artery disease, recent MIs, or low ejection fractions. Just uh, a, a um, couple pointers. Uh, when you're talking about thiazide diuretics, chlorothaladone is more potent and has a longer half-life than hydrochlorothiazide. In North America, in Canada, and US, we generally, uh, hydrochlorothiazide is more common. In Europe, chlorothaladone is more common. I don't know what's more common in, in, in Palestine these days, but chlorothaladone has a bit more evidence than hydrochlorothiazide and it is longer acting. Uh, but it is also associated with more hy hypokalemia and hyponatremia. So you need to be careful, uh, ideally measure 
uh, electrolytes um, sometime after starting these medications, particularly in higher risk patients. And as I mentioned, avoid the use of combining ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Now let's talk about resistant hypertension. So resistant hypertension by definition is when your blood pressure is above 140 over 90, despite the use of three or more medications at their optimal doses, and ideally one of those medications should be a diuretic. Or if a blood pressure is controlled, but it's requiring four drugs. In either of those definitions or scenarios, we call that resistant hypertension. Now, resistant hypertension is... Um, it needs to be differentiated from pseudo-resistance. And what we mean by pseudo-resistance are patients that are inappropriately um, classified as resistant hypertension, when in fact, it is, it is something else. And what are those common things that are something else? Poor blood pressure technique uh, can be a reason where you have higher blood pressure. So for example, using a small cuff on a large patient can, can artificially raise blood pressure. Uh, when uh, and, and, and so you need to be aware of that. Uh, poor adherence, so a patient is actually prescribed medications but not taking them, so they get, they get labeled as resistant hypertension when they are not. White coat effect, which is very common. Patients have elevated blood pressures at the office, but at home, actually, their blood pressures are fine. And lack of treatment or under-treatment can sometimes be an issue as well. Um, now, for true resistant hypertension, it does appear to be increasing over time. Uh, here's a, a population-based study uh, from the 1980s to the 2008 showing a significant increase in resistant hypertension over time. So over time, whether it's because of life, most likely because of lifestyle and probably in part because of longer lifespans, we are seeing more resistant hypertension uh, in, in, in the world. Um, a word about spironolactone and uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which are a very important class uh, for, for, for hypertension, for control of hypertension. There is increasing evidence that spironolactone is quite effective in resistant hypertension specifically. Many patients with resistant hypertension actually uh, have aldosterone excess, and trials that test aldosterone inhibitors have shown dramatic decreases in blood pressure in this population, this difficult to control uh, population. You know, many people with, with hypertension will be controlled with one or two agents and that's great. But when you're in the office and you're struggling with someone who has, you've used three or four medications on, they still have high blood pressure, you've ruled out the causes of pseudo uh, hypertension, you know, spironolactone is a medication you should keep in mind because it can be quite effective. This is a study which shows you here that um, uh, it, it demonstrates that primary uh, aldosteronism does exist in, in, in the general population. In this uh, study, you can see in untreated um, normal tensive patients, there's a small fraction of them that actually have elevated aldosterone above the um, upper limit of normal. In, in, in stage one hypertension and stage two hypertension, that proportion starts to increase. But then in resistant hypertension, it's a huge proportion of patients that have elevated aldosteronism. And it doesn't mean that these patients have Kahn syndrome. It doesn't mean these patients have an adrenal adenoma, but they just have relative increase in aldosterone levels. And it's for that reason why spironolactone um, tends to be effective. This is a um, data here showing you the effectiveness of aldosterone and, and its ability to reduce um, uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure in patients with resistant hypertension. And it's quite, as you can see, quite a significant drop here, a mean of tw uh, 20 for systolic and a mean of 10 diastolic at six weeks. And you can see that the effect, uh, a significant effect continues and is sustained right up to six months. So bottom line from this talk is consider spironolactone in those difficult to treat hypertensive patients in your practice. Now we do have other options because sometimes Spironolactone is, is contraindicated because of renal failure or hyperkalemia, for example, or patients can't tolerate it because of side effects um, uh, like gynecomastia for men, uh, et cetera. You, there are other options. So when you used your first line agents, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, beta blockers, and you're not getting success, these are other agents you can go to. 
So vasodilating beta blockers like levetalol and curvetalol can be quite effective. Centrally acting agents like clonidine and methyl dopa can also be effective, but be wary of clonidine because it has many side effects. Uh, alpha blockers like doxazacin or terazacin or prazacin are also can be uh, useful and can particularly be useful if in, in elderly patients, male patients that have um, BPH or prostate enlargement. And direct vasodilators like hydralazine and minoxidil also can play a role. So these are sort of second line agents when you're not having success or you're having poor tolerance of your first line agents. Uh, this slide is just to show you, demonstrate that your, um, uh, your um, labeled resistant hypertensive patients, many of those patients actually are just not adequately treated. They took in this study 387 patients that had been diagnosed and labeled as resistant hypertension, and they took them through a very special, uh, a very close follow-up and treatment in a, in a specialized clinic. And at the end of the study, 275 of those patients ended up getting control of their hypertension, while only 29 patients had true refractory hypertension. So only 9.5% of the original patient population that was labeled as resistant hypertensive uh, hypertension actually had resistant hypertension. It's just a reminder to us that many patients that seem like they don't have good control, if you get on top of dietary recommendations, if you ensure compliance with medical treatment, if you um, use lifestyle uh, measures, you can often get them uh, well controlled. And if you follow them closely enough um, in the outpatient setting as well. Uh, and what are additional interventions, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy uh, for hypertensive patients? Statins are a very good idea, especially with patients that have uh, three or more cardiovascular risk factors or history of cardiovascular disease. So anyone within that population, you should add in a statin, regardless of their lipid profile, as it will have uh, beneficial effects. And, uh, and we now add in SGLT inhibitors um, in diabetics, in um, diabetics with heart failure and patients with chronic kidney disease, even if they don't have diabetes. And so um, they're, they're to uh, consider uh, in these populations as uh, recent uh, trials have, have shown significant uh, outcome benefit with SGLT inhibitors uh, in those patient populations. Low dose aspirin is now no longer recommended, recommended for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. It used to be recommended that anyone with hypertension um, put them on an aspirin for protection, but if they don't have history of heart disease, it is no longer recommended. The risks of aspirin actually outweigh the benefit. Uh, so if you have resistant hypertension, as I mentioned before, consider the mineralocoid uh, resistant and uh, re receptor antagonist, pernilactone, aplerinone, finerinone. I don't know what's available in Palestine in your own, uh, in your communities, but spironolactone is, is widely available, even if the others are not. In Canada, it's hard still to, to uh, access aplerinone and finerinone, uh, but we obviously have access to spironolactone. And as I mentioned before in the other slide, alpha blockers and these other medications are second line agents that are useful. So that's an overview of how to uh, approach resistant hypertension uh, in terms of medications, first line agents, second line agents, and a couple uh, pointers to keep in mind. I'll just talk briefly about some other interventions that, are, that, that have been trialed for uh, hypertension. Renal sympath uh, sympathetic denervation is something that, that got a lot of press in the last few years, especially in Europe and the United States. Um, and it's basically ablating the sympathetic nerves in the, in the kidneys with the hope that that will reduce sympathetic outflow and reduce blood pressure. And it's minimally invasive. It's an endovascular procedure, usually done by interventional radiologists. It uses radiofrequency or ultrasound ablation to the renal arteries. And it, it does reduce blood pressure, um, and it has been shown to reduce blood pressure. Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem is in, in, in uh, subsequent robust, well-done RCTs, it did not show significant benefit. And when you test it against placebo, uh, there is benefit. But if you test it against best pharmacotherapy, uh, there isn't a significant difference. And so the bottom line for renal denervation is that it's a good option if you can't take medications or if you can't tolerate medications or if you have really poor compliance and you know the patient won't be treated, if you have access to renal denervation, 
then that would be a good option. But otherwise, most patients can be adequately treated with medications and you don't need to, to, to go to this step. Now let's talk about secondary hypertension. And secondary hypertension is different than resistant hypertension. Resistant hypertension is just hypertension, blood pressure that's not being controlled with the usual medical therapy. Secondary hypertension, as you know, is when there is actually a secondary medical cause to your blood pressure. And when do you, when should you be considering? Because as you know, most hypertension is called essential hypertension. More than 90 to 95% of patients um, are, have no identified secondary cause and they just get treated uh, with, with blood pressure medications and lifestyle measures. But there are situations when you should consider secondary hypertension. That is when you have severe or resistant hypertension, anyone with re that truly reaches the definition of resistant hypertension and you've ruled out pseudo resistance, you should consider secondary hypertension. If they have an acute rise in their blood pressure that's unexplained, you should think about secondary hypertension. When they have malignant or accel accelerated hypertension, so blood pressures that are above 180 to 200 systolic or, or high, very high blood pressures with end organ damage, so acute kidney injury, stroke, acute coronary syndrome, that kind of thing. If you have particularly young patients, you should consider secondary hypertension. And other clues that might come up that are related to a specific cause. So if a patient has uh, is a loud snorer, for example, um, or is obese and makes you think of obstructive sleep apnea, that then you should be you should have a low threshold to think about that. So what is our differential diagnosis of secondary hypertension? And this is how I divide it. I first talk, I think about renal causes, so renal artery stenosis um, and chronic kidney disease endocrine causes, and there's many here, but the main one is hyperaldosteronism, but others include pheochromocytoma, hypo or hyperthyroidism, hi hyperparathyroidism, um, and, and acromegaly. Obstructive sleep apnea is very common. It's actually probably the most common secondary cause. Uh, it's, it's very under uh, diagnosed and under treated, unfortunately. But I'll tell you that patients that I've identified with obstructive sleep apnea and treated with a CPAP machine have significantly improved their blood pressures. And so it can be something if identified and treated, you can have a profound effect on these patients' blood pressure, not just their blood pressure, but on end organ damage like pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and, and, and overall well-being. Coarctation of the aorta is a, is a rare cause of secondary hypertension and drugs. Some drugs some commonly used drugs like NSAIDs um, and oral contraceptive pills can, and, and, uh, can cause it. Steroids obviously can elevate blood pressure. Calcineurin inhibitors usually used in the context of transplantation, decongestants, MAOIs. These are drugs that you can think of. So this is my approach to secondary hypertension. Useful to have this list in, your, in the back of your mind uh, because you will see at some point patients that fall under these categories. So let's just briefly talk about some of these secondary causes. Renal artery stenosis is, is not an uncommon cause, actually. And when to think about it, renal artery stenosis, if you have severe onset hypertension above 55, think about this cause. If you have a rise in, your, in creatinine when you put a patient on an ACE or an ARP, think about renal artery stenosis. If you have concomitant atherosclerosis, like coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease, those patients are at particular risk for renal artery stenosis. If you have an atrophic kidney, if you do an ultrasound and you have an atrophic kidney, um, that often is a sign of renal artery stenosis, where on the side of that atrophic kidney, the renal artery stenosis completely cut off the blood supply of that, of that side and that kidney atrophied. And if you have recurrent flash pulmonary edema is a classic symptom of renal artery stenosis. And if you hear an abdominal brewy in abdominal examination, particularly if it lateralizes on one side, uh, then consider renal artery stenosis. Now, what are you going to do about renal artery stenosis? You're going um, potentially to do endovascular procedures and try to open up the, uh, do angioplasty and open up the lesion that's blocking the renal artery. Uh, however, if you're doing it, it depends on why you're doing it. So in this study, the astral RCT, but also other RCTs have been done as well that have shown the same thing, which is using medical therapy against that um, proven renal artery stenosis is just as good as revascularization when it comes to long-term kidney uh, health. 
and um, and 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 so we don't necessarily do it for that reason. We only do renal artery. We only pursue endovascular procedures if you have recurrent flash pulmonary edema, if you have uncontrolled hypertension, or if you have a rapidly rising creatinine. Outside of those situations, even if you diagnose renal artery stenosis, it can be treated with medical therapy alone. So I don't necessarily investigate for renal artery stenosis unless I have one of those things. I'll just briefly talk about uh, primary aldosteronism. Um, this is a, think about this condition if you have resistant hypertension with hypokalemia especially, or if you find an adrenal incidentaloma when a CT scan is done for another reason. If you do get that, you can send the patient for plasma renin activity and aldosterone levels, as well as an aldosterone to renin ratio. And I've given here some directions for that that you can have in the slide deck, you can come back to. And you can, of course, refer a patient that you're considering hyperaldosteronism to, to an endocrinologist to, uh, to further work up. Uh, you may want to screen for pheochromocytoma in situations where you have proxismal, unexplained, labile, and or severe refractory hypertension. And if you have certain symptoms like headaches, palpitations, sweating, panic attacks, or pallor, and you can uh, send them for 24-hour um, urine catecholamines or catecholamines or whatever your local lab does for pheochromocytoma. Again, you can refer them to an endocrinologist about that. Obstructive sleep apnea, I'll just leave you with because it's a critical um, uh, 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 diagnosis to identify in the right pop in the right population and then treat with CPAP. It can have a really big effect on patients if you can diagnose it. Anyone who's obese, who has a snoring history, who has headaches during the day or lack of focus or energy, think about this. Ask their um, their 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 spouse or their family members if they snore because sometimes they don't know if they snore and and consider a sleep study in that population. Coarctation is not common, but if there's a difference in, in blood pressure between the right and the left sides uh, or between the arms and the legs, then consider this uh, diagnosis. And, uh, and so that, uh, that is really all I wanted uh, to cover in the formal presentation. I wanted to walk you through um, approach to, to regular hypertension, how to deal with resistant hypertension, and, and, and what to think of when it comes to secondary hypertension. And I'd love to now entertain your uh, questions or comments. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>